So this lecture, as Andrew intimated, is part of a project on how ideas and practices of Christian faith evolve between the second century and about the early fifth. And it's a sequel uh, to my last book about faith in very early churches. And faith, I should say, is really a placeholder translation because Greek pistis, Latin fides, and comparable terms in early, other languages of early churches have a very wide range of meaning. They include trust, trustworthiness, faithfulness, good faith, a pledge, a guarantee, a legal trust, a rhetorical proof, belief, plus a few meanings which are specific to Christianity, including the new covenant, the content of doctrine, and the faith, meaning the cult as a whole. And it's often important what shade of meaning is in play, but I will use faith as a sort of general translation. And this talk is about an aspect of faith which has really been very little noticed, but I think is remarkably rich and thought-provoking. And that is the imagery by which people describe what faith is and what it does. And this imagery appears in all kinds of writing, but especially in pastoral and devotional writing. And it's varied, colourful, dynamic, and occasionally really strange. But I shall argue that it adds something to our understanding of theology, of Christian psychology, and to our sense of why and how faith continued to be so important to Christians beyond the earliest generations. So, from its earliest records, Christian faith has been imagined as something active and productive. You know, for Paul, it enables people to be forgiven and made right with God. In a much-cited saying of Jesus, it has the power to move mountains. But with that exception, the early language of faith is not very imagistic. You know, and on the whole, early writings don't explore what faith is. They let us guess from the context. But from the second century, we find a steady increase in imagery, which does explore what faith is and what it does. And given that faith has always been linked with salvation and healing, it is no surprise to find that some of this imagery is medical. And it's worth making a brief point about method here, uh, because there are quite a lot of images that appear just once in one author. But today, I'm interested in images that appear in several authors, or sometimes in many authors, and many times in multiple writers, because those, and especially when they appear in works like sermons, which are composed for large audiences, those, I think, have the best claim to articulate shared ways of thinking. Those are part of Christian mentality. So, a lot of writers appeal to the idea of faith as medicine, the medicine of salvation, John Chrysostom calls it in one homily on John. And he can even talk about uh, going to church as being like going to the pharmacy to get your shot. You know. John is very fond of shop imagery in general. It's an urbanite. Now, we might think that faith as medicine is what Augustine would have called fides quae, the faith that believers believe, the content of doctrine. And occasionally it is. But more often, it is fides qua, the faith by which we believe, you know, what goes on in our hearts and minds. And that turns out to be true of images in general. You know, sometimes they refer to what we believe, but their main interest is in how we believe, in what is going on for us when we have faith. So, for instance, Augustine says in another sermon on John, uh, John 16, this is, um, that the act of believing or trusting in Christ is the medicine of all the wounds of the soul. And in letter 98, he's reassuring a couple who are worried about bringing their child to baptism because the child can't exercise its own fides. And Augustine says, don't worry, because if the child's own faith can't act as the medicine, the sacrament can. But for adults, by implication, it is their own faith that is the medicine. It may seem a bit confusing that 
the same images are so often used of the content and the act of faith. And I think that happens partly because uh, they draw on the same small group of authoritative early texts, the emerging New Testament canon, for much of their imagery. But I suspect it's also because Christians always want to hold all the meanings of their faith language together. You know, they feel it is no accident that the act of trusting or believing in God and the new covenant and the content of doctrine are all called faith. And using the same imagery of all of them is one way to kind of express their integrity, if not exactly to explain it. Anyway, the idea that faith can act as medicine for our souls doesn't necessarily imply that it's entirely in our hands. In fact, through this period, it becomes more and more common to affirm that faith is a gift from God. Fides in te, donum dei est, Augustine is fond of saying. Now that's an idea, of course, which goes back to 1 Corinthians 12, where pistis is a gift of the spirit, and Galatians 5, where it's a fruit of the spirit. And it becomes a significant theme, not least in debates about grace and free will. But the imagery of faith doesn't polarise grace and free will as some argumentative writing does. It more often seems to reflect a sort of intuitive sense that faith is complicated. You know, it is given to us and we have to accept it. And it does something for us that we couldn't do for ourselves but we also have to exercise it. You know, so for Ephraim the Syrian, in one of his many hymns on faith, faith is a trumpet, which we are given in order to play loudly in the street. If you have a call to street corner evangelism, that is your um, text of choice. For John Chrysostom in Sermon 54, it's an oak tree, which is planted in people's souls for them to tend. And for Ambrose, in one of his letters to bishops, faith is the drachma which the woman receives, loses, and has to find again in order to save her soul. It's not uncommon, actually, to find writers co-opting gospel images of the kingdom as images of faith. It's quite interesting, and I'm going to come back to that at the very end. So medical imagery and the idea that faith is a gift from God are both linked with the idea of faith as salvific. And salvation, and specifically the elevation of the soul from earth to God or to heaven, is the focus of another cluster of images. Faith lifts the soul up from earth to God, says the second century collection of gnomic sayings, the sentences of Sextus. Clement in the Pydagogos, of course, famously sees faith as a ship's rope, by which we haul ourselves up to God. While for Ephraim, the faith of the thief on the cross possesses him and raises him to paradise. But that said, most images of faith focus less on paradise and more on what faith does in this life. And this is an interesting development because very early Christian writings say very little about what faith does or what we do with it after conversion, except that we have to keep having it. But later writers get more and more interested in faith after conversion, no doubt because they expect to have more life after conversion. <laughs> One late antique dice oracle says, don't abandon the faith that is in your heart. It is helpful to you. They're very clunky, these dice oracles, but they had a lot of credence. And sometimes the help that faith gives is as a foundation for the church or for Christian life. For example, in the second century, shepherd of Hermas, Hermas is given a vision of the church as a tower which is in the process of being built. And all the parts of the tower stand for God or virtues or various groups of Christians. And the whole structure is supported by seven women who are an eclectic group of virtues, of which the first and most foundational is Pistis. Because as the church herself says, through Pistis, the chosen of God are saved. And when the tower is finished, the church says, the end will come. 
but that time is not yet. And in the meantime, faith is the basis for all the other qualities that Christians need in this life. And for John Chrysostom too, in a baptismal instruction, faith is the indestructible foundation of piety, in this case, which everything else is built on. It is the anchor which holds life in place. I wonder actually whether the PowerPoint would still be visible if we had the lights up again. Would that be okay? I think that's probably okay, isn't it? It has the great advantage that I can see my notes as well. <laughs> but the most widely used image of faith in this life is as a ship which carries the faithful across the turbulent seas of this world, weathering storms and landing them safely in the harbour of heaven. And interestingly, uh, interestingly, we are very used to imagining heaven you know, as a kingdom or a city. But in these images, heaven is always the harbour. You know, and that is the Mediterranean mindset. Most people's most visceral experience of salvation must have been getting to a safe harbour when you've been out on the sea. You might think that a faith that we sail in, a boat, would be you know, the faith or the church, and occasionally it is. So, for instance, um, Origen, in his second sermon on Genesis, offers a typical double interpretation of Noah's Ark. And in the spiritual sense, he says the Ark is the faith, the church. And in the Ark as church, incidentally, uh, the people who have knowledge and reason, like Origen, live on the top deck with Noah, while the simpliciores, the ordinary people, travel in the bottom with the cockroaches. <laughs> but in the ethical sense, Origen says, the Ark is our faith. And if any person can turn away from this world of vice and evil and hear the word of God and heavenly teachings, that person is building an Ark of salvation within their own heart, out of faith, hope and love. For Tertullian, too, the faith we sail in is our faith. In On Idolatry, he says, many people have suffered the shipwreck of their faith. <coughs> but amid the reefs and inlets of vice, that is, the shallows and straits of idolatry, faith navigates, her sails filled with the Spirit of God, safe if cautious, secure if intently watchful. But for those who are washed overboard, there is a deep there is no swimming out of. Those who run aground suffer inescapable shipwreck. For those who are engulfed, every wave suffocates. Every eddy sucks one down into hell. Without faith, says John Chrysostom, we're like people trying to cross the sea without a ship. They can swim for a while with their hands and feet, but as they get further out, they're swamped by the waves. That's how much it matters to have faith. There's also a variation on the ship image, which I have only found so far in Ambrose and Augustine, and I think Augustine got it from Ambrose, but I'm going to mention it anyway because I like it so much. Um, and that is the idea of faith as a fish. And this, may I introduce you to my personal favourite of all early Christian fish. <laughs> Thanks to uh, uh, Roman Sachs. Um, I like him because there's something about the set of the eye which makes him look really doubtful. <laughs> <laughs> Very very just a doubting Thomas of fish. Fide, says Augustine, is, a, is like a fish because it can live and thrive in the seas of this world and swim unharmed through its tempests and temptations. Meanwhile, for those who think of their journey as fa of faith as more land-based, according to Prudentius's Psychomachia, faith weaves new clothes for the hearts cleansed by baptism and setting out on their journey, and in many writings, it shines a light upon the road. And as we travel, faith has yet more roles in our lives. 
So one popular cluster of images sees faith as a guide and a teacher. May Pistis be your guide in all good actions, say the sentences of Sextus. And Clement tells readers of the Protrepticus that faith will lead you in, experience will teach you, scripture will train you. And there is a fascinating epigraphic example of this on the late second century tombstone of one Aberchius of Hierapolis in Asia Minor. And I will just read uh, parts of this, starting with the second sentence. He says, my name is Aberchius, disciple of the Holy Shepherd Christ. It was he who taught me trustworthy knowledge. And it was he who sent me to Rome, on pilgrimage apparently, to see the queen of cities and to see a queen with golden robes and golden shoes. This is probably the church. And everywhere Pistis led the way. Everywhere she fed me with fish from the spring, great and pure, caught by a holy maiden. I think the fish there may well be doctrine, and the image also draws, presumably, on the uh, feeding of the 5,000. And if that's the case, uh, then you may notice an interesting parallel there between the actions of Pistis and those of Christ, and just hold on to that thought for a little while, because we're coming back to it. And when the 4th century pilgrim Egeria, on her journey around the Near East, reaches Syrian Edessa, the local bishop says to her, my daughter, I can see what a long journey this is on which your fides has brought you. So let us show you all the local sites. And on the journey, faith is often a nurturing or a comforting presence. A couple of tombstones from late antique Gaul refer to faith as alma fides. That's a phrase lifted straight out of Roman religion. Alma fides procured for somebody whose name is lost, the height of apostolicity. And when he died, he went up to heaven. While for Ambrose, in one of his evening hymns, watchful faith with cooling care soothes our fevered brows as we fall asleep. And in more extreme situations, faith does much more. Peter Chrysologus, in a sermon, describes the martyrdom of St. Lawrence on the gridiron, which is clearly a horrible death. But as Peter tells it, it's made almost bearable with the help of faith. So he says, next, someone brought out the well-known gridiron for martyring Lawrence by roasting him. He was bound fast by iron, but he regarded that gridiron of torture as a bed of rest. We admire his patience. Let us admire this as a gift from God. In this case, his faith was not burning painfully in him. It was even consoling the man who was being roasted. Why was faith consoling him? Because, and I think there is something a bit wrong with the Latin here, actually. I think it should mean it was keeping him faithful to the one who was making promises. So there, leaving aside the quite spectacular bad taste of the whole passage, frankly. This is the passage on the basis of which St. Lawrence is the patron saint of cooks. It's really, really in the worst possible taste. However, there, here faithfulness as a gift from God seems to be taking Lawrence's pain away. And for Prudentius in the Harmatogenia, when the souls of the faithful finally reach heaven, Faith is there, like Abraham or like God's self, to clasp them to her bosom and let them unload all their troubles. Then, he says, as the exiled soul returns to be reinstated in her heavenly country, white-haired fides, cana fides, another very Roman phrase, receives her to her bosom and comforts her nursling with tender affection, while the soul plaintively describes the many toils she has endured since she took up lodging in the flesh. Now, it won't have escaped you that in several of those passages, faith is more or less strongly personified. And I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But first, it's worth summing up where we've got to so far. So these images describe faith as saving us and changing us, 
acting as the foundation of our lives, carrying us safely through life, supporting and comforting, relieving suffering, teaching and guiding us, and one way or another, getting us to heaven. And they convey vividly how important faith is, and more, how people can imagine faith as a dynamic force at the centre of their lives, and life itself as a project to which faith is essential. And all that makes faith extraordinarily precious, you know, which nobody captures better than Ephraim. In his hymns, faith is a priceless pearl which a merchant offers to his king. It's a peeled grape, the most luxurious thing a vine dresser can offer to his master. And it's a beautiful bride who should be carried in triumph through the marketplace. It is the most valuable thing in anybody's life. Now, of course, the drama of these images shouldn't blind us to the fact that for most Christians, most of the time, life probably wasn't that dramatic or indeed dangerous, especially by the fourth century. But that in itself may be one reason why faith imagery develops so much. You know, we often reflect that by the fourth century, people no longer expect the final cosmic battle any day and persecution or martyrdom are no longer a regular risk. And so we say, perhaps monasticism, for instance, and asceticism develop in part as an alternative framework in, the, in which those with a very dramatic and dynamic sense of their life of faith can live it out. And I suggest that the imagery of faith does something similar, but does it for all the faithful. It creates a mental set in which everyday life is a drama, a journey, a building project in which all the faithful have to take part. And most dramatically of all, Faith helps the faithful to fight for their faith, and even fights for them, defending them against attack, bearing the brunt of their suffering in martyrdom, and seeing off the devil and his hosts. And it's in those roles that faith is most strongly personified. And I'm not going to worry very much here about the exact boundaries of personification. It's well recognized as a specialized form of metaphor, and the point at which metaphor becomes allegory or personification is often quite unclear and probably is often meant to be. You know. But my criterion here is broadly that faith is personified when it's described with some physical characteristic and it's doing something in the narrative which is different from what any other agent is doing. Yeah. Now, the idea that faith fights for us, ultimately, I think, must go back to Ephesians 6, where Pistis is a shield. But that shield quickly morphs into later writers into a weapon, and indeed into increasingly large and violent weapons, you know, from swords to um, slings to bows and arrows to siege engines, you know. Uh, Cyril of Alexandria says, um, faith is a sword whose faith is strong and broad. And by the fourth century, faith is often the one wielding the weapon. And no description of faith as a warrior is better known than that of Prudentius in his poem of around 400, The Psychomachia. This is a passage from near the beginning of it. Fides, he says, first takes the field to face the doubtful chances of battle, her rough dress disordered, her shoulders bare, her hair untrimmed, her arms exposed. And see, first, worship of the old gods ventures to match her strength against Fide's challenge and strike at her. But she, rising higher, smites her foe's head down with its fillet-decked brows, lays in the dust that mouth that was sated with the blood of beasts and tramples the eyes underfoot, squeezing them out in death. This, I may say, is far from being the most bloodthirsty passage of the poem. I spared you much worse. It's a very remarkable poem in many ways. And there are all sorts of things we might be tempted to explore in it. 
you know, for one, its personification of faith proves to be a very clever mechanism for encompassing all the meanings of faith sort of under one helmet, as it were, because Prudentius Fides at different points in the poem is a gift from God, the trust of the faithful, the faith as a whole, and true doctrine. You know. And personification also sort of tunes up that sense of faith as a force at the centre of Christian life, and life as a drama in which faith is crucial. You know, life does not get much more exciting than having a bare-armed heroine battling inside you for your soul. Who would not want that? <laughs> but I just want to touch briefly for now um, on two points about this poem. It's psychology and it's theology. Because the poem as a whole is an epic account of the war for the Christian soul between the virtues led by Fides and a matched rank of vices. And it begins with a prologue which traces God's command to make war on the vices, highly implausibly, back to Abraham. And most of the poem consists of a series of duels between Fides, Pudicitia, Patientia, Mens Humilis, and others, and their opposites, interspersed with stirring speeches about repentance and Christian life. And Prudentius presents the battle as taking place within a human soul, and most commentators assume that the soul is doing battle with itself. A few have argued that the virtues and vices represent opposing forces in the battle between God and the powers of the world, or even that they're echoes of the deified abstractions of Greek and Roman cult. And I think there is some point to all of those ideas, but none of them is quite right. Because the idea that there is tension between virtues and vices in the soul goes back to Plato, though philosophers don't tend to talk about progress in virtue as a war. And Prudentius's terminology of virtues and vices is philosophical. But his picture of what is happening in the soul owes more to the Pauline epistles. In particular, the idea that the faithful are given various qualities as gifts by the Holy Spirit, and the idea that the faithful are fighting a war in themselves against the devil. So in the prologue, Prudentius says that the example of Abraham tells us that a bellicosus spiritus must do battle and overcome the monsters in our enslaved heart. So the vices are in some sense part of us because they're inside us, but not part of us because they are monsters that enslave our heart and later our bodies. And when all the vices have been expelled, Christ himself will enter the humble abode of the pure heart and give it the privilege of entertaining the Trinity. And Prudentius then appeals to Christ to tell him with what fighting force the mind, <coughs> men's, is armed. Quite common for uh, both mainstream and Christian writers to slip between men's core and animus as the location of virtues and vices. Anyway, Prudentius already knows the answer to this question. The fighting force is the virtues under Christ's leadership. And his list of virtues notoriously doesn't correspond with anybody else's. But nearly all of them are qualities familiar from either 1 Corinthians 12 or Galatians 5 as either gifts or fruits of the Spirit. And as I've already mentioned, the idea that uh, the qualities which have been given to us help us to fight the devil appears several times in early epistles, most famously in Ephesians 6. And in those passages, the qualities the faithful put on are again not their own virtues, but gifts from God, which enable them to defend themselves in the cosmic war with the devil. So the psychology of this poem owes something to philosophy but rather more to the Pauline epistles. And it's never fully described because articulating a fully-fledged theory of the soul was not Prudentius's prime concern. But the poem does convey a strong sense that the most important thing a Christian soul can do is to be receptive to Christ, to let Christ and his troops in to do their work, which may indeed be another Pauline idea in origin. If Prudentius had in mind, I live no longer I, but Christ lives in me. 
But that is rather different from the very philosophically informed theories of the soul, which patrologists very fairly attribute to many other writers. Prudentius has little or no sense that what matters in faith is knowledge or reason or the control of the best part of the soul over the rest of the soul or the rest of the self. You know, his vision is much more about openness and receptivity and acquiescence to Christ. And this is a piece of work that I haven't yet done, but I strongly suspect that that is a much more widespread model of Christian psychology uh, than we have kind of really yet recognised. Well, as we've seen, Prudentius is by no means the only writer who personifies faith, especially when the life of faith is being imagined as a battle. And in scenes of combat, the imagery of faith reveals something not only about these writers' psychology, but also some quite striking theology. So here is Paulinus celebrating the birthday of St. Felix of Nola in poem 15 and describing how a martyr's faith holds out under persecution. Faith, he says, defeats men armed with steel through its awareness of heavenly truth. It measures future life against immediate death and it joyfully restores to God the <coughs> mind which is victorious over the conquered body and transports it to the delighted stars. So Felix eagerly stood his ground like a wall against a savage foe. His blooming faith lent him fresh strength in his old age. Concentrating his mind on heaven, mindful of Christ, forgetful of the world, he bore God in his heart and his person was filled with Christ. His body now no longer contained him. He seemed a sanctified, greater being and his eyes and countenance shone with heavenly glory. It's a topos of martyrologies that the martyr either puts on or is filled with God and Christ, and that the presence of God with a human being causes shining. But here, Fides is alongside God and Christ, helping Felix in the same way. And this is far from an isolated passage. We've already seen faith behaving very like Christ in a sermon of Peter Chrysologus, consoling St. Lawrence on the gridiron and taking away his pain. And in his hymn, in honour of St. Lawrence, Prudentius goes even further. He describes how, in Christianity's battle with mainstream cult, Fides fought in arms, not sparing her own blood, for by death she destroyed death and spent herself to save herself. <coughs> now that is a very remarkable passage because the language of salvation and the destruction of death unmistakably references the saving death of Christ. And the phrase, by death she destroyed death, goes straight back to 2 Timothy 1.10. So here, Fides, either Lawrence's faith or the faith, or perhaps both, is identified with Christ himself. She reenacts Christ's saving death and is imagined as continuing Christ's work on earth in the ongoing battle with idolatry. So in these passages, faith acts as a form of God's ongoing presence with the faithful, with them or in them in very much the way that the risen Christ and the Spirit do. And I doubt, in fact, that that idea is confined to personifications. It makes explicit something which one might see as implicit in the imagery of medicine and teaching and guidance too. But we might think that it is theologically a bit risque. You know, do we need, at this point, any more intermediaries between Christ and the God and the faithful? Yeah. Christians have already got their work cut out explaining how it is that they don't have three gods. You know, is this the moment to you know, personify and reify Fides as another one? In practice, and this strikes me as quite remarkable, nobody seems very worried about this. I mean, the fourth century is, of course, an era in which intermediaries proliferate, not least in the cult of Mary and the saints. 
And it is true that faith never becomes a sort of fully-fledged hypostasis of God, as Roman faith is of Jupiter. I haven't yet found anybody actually praying to her. Although, I have found one example of Christians being exhorted to worship faith. And this is in Severian of Gabala's Day for Day. I really would like to know what people thought of that. It seems to me perhaps a step too far. However. It may be at least, I think, a bit of an outlier. You know, it seems that on the whole, Fides acts as an intermediary sometimes, as flexibly, as and when that's what people want her to do. And that is really one of the attractions of imagery. You know, it allows us to think creatively about the role of something like faith in our relationship with God without getting bogged down in questions about essence or hypostasis or the exact nature of the entity. But what is clear is that in this period, faith is crucial to the divine human relationship, to the point where it can be described as the sign and the substance of God's presence with the faithful. By having faith, they have God, and God has them. You might be surprised um, at this point that I haven't yet mentioned perhaps the best known of all personifications of pistis, and that is the so-called Gnostic pistis Sophia. And now that is a very Christian story, and Pistis herself there is very definitely a personification. But it isn't really a story about what Pistis is or how it works. Because Pistis here is an allegory of the faithful soul itself, which has been tricked into falling from grace, but longs to return to the light and eventually does. So it's really a story about the soul rather than a story about faith, and that's why um, I'm not including it here. Well, I'm coming to the last section of the lecture. You'll be glad to know. I always think it's nice to know that. <laughs> it's something to look forward to. <laughs> but at this point, I have to pause for a moment and mention a colleague of mine in Oxford called Lucy Wooding, whom some of you may know, who is an expert on early modern Christianity and, among other things, uh, iconography. Because a few weeks ago, I gave a talk which involved some of this imagery. And afterwards, Lucy asked, do we find visual images of faith in antiquity, as we do so often in modern iconography? This is one of several dozen pre-Raphaelite images of faith in English church windows. And I was drawing breath to say, not as far as I know, when I thought, oh, but faith is a ship. And faith is a tower and an anchor and a fish. And it heals and feeds and guides us. So I went away and I read some of Lucy's work and she has really transformed my sense of how we can think about the relationship between early Christian art and text. Because images like the ones that I have just shown are among the most popular that we find in early Christian spaces. And we are very familiar with what we think of as their symbolism, the fish for Christ, the ship for the church, the anchor for hope, and so on. But as far as I know, nobody has really reflected on how closely some of the most popular early images are linked with faith, or how often they reference gospel stories in particular, which are about faith. But I suspect that we should think of a close symbiosis between how people are taught to think about faith and the visual imagery with which they're surrounded. And indeed, actually, when you think about it, it's an obvious assumption because using images to represent gods and religious concepts is ubiquitous in the ancient world. You know, in Roman art, fides alone can be represented by clasped hands, poppy heads, Mercury's staff, an ear of grey in a cornucopia. You know, people expected to encounter that kind of symbolic imagery and they knew how to read it. And it is striking how many of the most popular early images of uh, reference stories that illustrate faith and recognise its importance. You know, the healings of the woman with the haemorrhage or the man born blind, both of which you could see in that sarcophagus if you look closely. 
the raisings of Lazarus and Jairus' daughter. All of these put questions about Pistis or praise of Pistis at the centre of the story. You know, the most dramatic gospel stories set in boats, the stilling of the storm, the walking on water, involve a challenge to the faith of the disciples or Jesus criticising them for not having faith enough. You know, and one could go on. The feeding of the 5,000, followed in God, John's gospel by Jesus teaching that people should not be looking for signs but believing in him. And we assume that these images are popular because of the ways they represent Jesus, and no doubt that is true. But they're also showing worshippers how to have faith in Jesus. You know, maybe you see an image of Jesus healing someone, there's a woman with the hemorrhage on the left there, and you think, that is the kind of faith I need. Maybe you see the good shepherd and think, I can trust him. You know, images may even encourage certain ways of thinking about faith. You know, very early Christian writings don't define faith. The possible exception is Hebrews 11.1, 1, and um, I think it is arguable whether that is really intended as a definition of faith. But patristic writings, as we've seen, often say faith is X or Y, you know, and that seems to me to be a formula that one might derive from an image. You know, imagine a preacher or a catechist looking around a church, seeing an image on a wall of a ship or a fish and saying, look, faith is like that. Faith is like a ship. Faith is like a fish. Yeah. And we can go further. In patristic writings, biblical or proto-biblical texts, are often interpreted not really using the text as such, but using a kind of snapshot generated from it. And we've already seen this in Origen's sermon on Noah's Ark. So his interpretation of the Ark, which I described, doesn't interpret the narrative. What it does is to take an image of the Ark and interpret that. Imagine a ship with these levels, people living in different levels. Since Noah's Ark is another common early Christian image, it is not a huge stretch to imagine Origen not just reminding his congregation of the images he preaches, but even pointing to an image that they can see. And I have not yet found an example of somebody talking in a sermon, for instance, about faith with an explicit reference to an image that his congregation might be able to see. But there are quite a lot of examples of that happening in medieval and early modern sermons. And the converse can happen too. You know, we heard Tertullian's image of faith as a ship which has to navigate the seas of life before making it to harbour. But that narrative is not derived directly from any text. It's generated from the image of a ship, one which he could easily have seen in art, an image which itself probably derives from a story like the storm at sea. So stories inspire images, and images inspire slightly different stories, which are told to make a particular point about something like faith. And if we go back to Fermier's tombstone, there's an even more complex interaction on display. So this is an image of a ship approaching a lighthouse, which means it's about to arrive safely in harbour. But there are no lighthouses in uh, the Septuagint or the emerging New Testament. So this doesn't derive directly from any authoritative text that we know of, but it could derive from any one of dozens of images of faith like Tertullian's. Yeah. And if so, then this is an imagization of a narrative of a ship reaching harbour, which itself is derived from an image of a ship, which was derived itself from a text like, say, the storm at sea. And this is used to make a new point appropriate for a tombstone. Fermia has kept the faith. She has navigated all the dangers of this life and now she's made it to heaven. So in this rich relationship between art and text, both texts and images can manipulate the images or the text they draw on to make their own point. And here is one last example. Now this, is, a pro I think, a 19th century drawing of what is supposed to be a 4th century Christian seal. And I haven't been able to find whether the original still exists. If anybody happens to, be know, to know, I'd be glad to know. Seals are also notoriously difficult to date and frighteningly easy to forge. 
Uh, but let us be optimistic for a minute and assume that this is a fourth century image. It represents Peter walking across the water to Jesus from Matthew 14, up to a point. Because Peter is not sinking. He is kneeling on the waves. And you can see very clearly his back foot is not just above the waves, but it is braced in the way that a foot is when you uh, kneel on land. And he is taking Jesus' hand in a gesture that looks, to me, more like offering loyalty to a king than grabbing at a lifesaver. And two of the disciples are waving their arms, but it's not very clear whether they're frightened or just excited. And best of all, the ship is riding on top of an enormous fish. <laughs> this, I need not tell you, does not appear in the gospel. <laughs> It's not uncommon to find fish or sea serpents underneath ships in engraved seals and gems from right back into the archaic period. But they don't usually seem to be holding the ship up. So is the fish Christ and the ship the church, say? Or is the fish faith and the ship is Christ? Or is it purely decorative? Somebody just had a brainstorm and thought they'd have a fish. <laughs> Don't know. But you know, what seems clear is that this is not an image of fear or doubt or the failure of faith. This is reinterpreting Matthew to create an image of faith and loyalty. And maybe whoever commissioned the seal just misremembered the story. Or maybe they'd heard an interpretation of the story as being about faith, and that would be very common because gospel stories that often look to us as being very much about the failure of faith have a strong tendency to be reinterpreted to emphasise the virtue of faith by patristic writers. Or maybe... The engraver is deliberately conflating two stories here, the walking on water and Peter's confession in Matthew 16, which would also uh, be something which is quite commonly done. The very earliest images of nativity stories already have both shepherds and magi at the crib, for instance. So. But whatever is going on here, it shows how texts and images can interact to create much more than simple representations. They use each other to develop and enrich people's thinking about faith. Well, images really deserve a lecture to themselves. But even this brief excursus shows that not only do the texts that early Christians hear and read tell them a lot about what faith is and how it works, but so do the images that surround them and the relationships between the two. Well, we could go on. I haven't even mentioned that faith is a yoke and a feast and a sweet scent and a flaming coal and a priestess. But it's time to conclude. Between the second and the early fifth century, the concept of faith was becoming more complicated and its centrality in Christian lives was being articulated in increasingly varied ways. This is the period when the idea of the faith evolves in the sense both of the cult and the sense of a body of orthodox doctrine. It's the period when belief in the truth of doctrine becomes ever more important and is eventually institutionalized as essential to becoming and remaining Christian. It's a time when what it means to be faithful becomes, for some writers, very socially specific. And slaves and women and bishops are encouraged to tailor their faith to their <coughs> social situation. And it's a time when some people invest more in enacting faith, ritually, by church-going, which I talked about in a lecture here last year. But it is also the period when Christians become increasingly interested in the interiority of faith, in what is going on inside a faithful person during their mm -hmm. lifetime. And the images we've explored today are above all images of that interior life. And they show it being imagined in a host of creative, colourful and dynamic ways. And this is one of the roots of what will become a huge wealth of medieval and early modern writing about interiority. These images tell us that faith is strong and beautiful and reliable and resourceful. Like Christ or the Spirit, Christ is with the faithful and in them. 
healing them and comforting them, feeding and teaching and fighting for them. It will carry them through all the storms of this life and bring them safely to the harbour of heaven. In his commentary on Matthew 13, Ambrose observes that the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Elsewhere, he points out, Jesus says that if you have faith like a mustard seed, you can move mountains. So, he says, faith is a mustard seed, and the kingdom is a mustard seed, and therefore, in flagrant defiance of the laws of formal logic, he says, it follows that faith definitely is the kingdom of heaven, and the kingdom of heaven is faith. The power and the beauty of faith is such that even in embryo, it is already everything that anybody could desire. Thank you.